from the meticulous strokes of a samurai sword to the deep introspection of a stoic emperor, from the pursuit of raw masculinity in the modern era to the wisdom sought amidst concentration camp fences, what does it truly mean to be a superior man? Why has this quest consumed thinkers, warriors and scholars from every corner of the world and every epoch of history? The universe has seen countless sunrises and sunsets, civilizations rise and fall, technologies evolve and cultures transform. Yet, a singular, unyielding quest has echoed through the ages, threading itself through the fabric of history, culture and individual pursuit, the quest to become a superior man. At first glance, one might assume this means physical prowess, the strength of Hercules or the agility of a panther. While physicality is an aspect, the true essence of the superior man dives far deeper. It transcends cultures, eras and personal ambitions. It melts the palpable with the ethereal, creating an archetype that is revered, respected and most importantly, relatable. From ancient scrolls to digital blogs, the teachings of the world's greatest philosophers and authors give testament to humanity's unending journey of self-betterment. It is a journey not defined by the destination but by the steps taken, the hurdles overcome and the insights gleaned. It's a story of mankind's unwavering resolve to rise above, not merely in stature or accomplishment, but in spirit and character. The concept of virtue, a moral excellence sought after by ancient Greeks, holds paramount significance in this quest. Aristotle famously mentioned, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act but a habit. But this habit is not cultivated in isolation. It's a synthesis of reflection, understanding and action. Virtue, after all, is more than a list of good deeds. It's a mindset, a way of being. Moreover, wisdom, a deep understanding and realization of people, things, events or situations, has always been a cherished prize, often equated with the light that dispels the darkness of ignorance. From the mystics meditating in the Himalayas to the scholars debating in the Athenian Agora, the quest for wisdom has been as varied as it has been relentless. But what truly is a superior man? Is it just a mosaic of virtues and wisdom? Perhaps, but it's also about how one wields these attributes. A superior man doesn't just possess knowledge, he applies it. He doesn't merely have virtues, he lives by them. He isn't just molded by experiences, he learns and grows from them. The beauty of this pursuit lies in its universality. Regardless of the age one lives in, the fundamental human desire remains unchanged, to evolve, to improve, and to resonate with a higher version of oneself. It's not just about having superior skills or being recognized for one's talents. It's about character, carrying oneself with grace, facing challenges with resilience and wielding power with humility. In the chapters of history, we'll find these superior men appearing as samurai warriors, Roman emperors, Renaissance thinkers, or even 20th century intellectuals. Their backgrounds might differ, their challenges distinct, but their core pursuit remains interconnected. To reach an elevated state of being, to understand oneself and the world profoundly, and to leave an indelible mark, not of conquests, but of character. As we embark on this journey today, delving deep into lessons from some of the most revered philosophers and authors, we invite you to reflect, introspect, and perhaps find that superior man within yourself. The path is ageless, the quest eternal, and the rewards immeasurable. Join us as we traverse the path of the superior man, a journey through ages, yet timeless in its essence. The rustic clang of steel against steel, the meticulous art of calligraphy, the gentle embrace of nature's solace, all these seemingly disparate elements come together in the life of one legendary figure, Miyamoto Musashi. Often heralded as Japan's greatest swordsman, Musashi was not just a master of the blade, but also a philosopher, strategist and artist. His life lessons and legacy offer profound insights into the making of a superior man. 
Born in the late 16th century, Musashi's life was a tapestry of duels, travels, and deep introspections. His renown in swordsmanship was not merely due to his unparalleled skill, but also his unique approach to combat and life. This approach is detailed exquisitely in his seminal work, The Book of Five Rings, but equally illuminating is another of his lesser known works, the Dokodo or The Way of Walking Alone. The Dokodo offers 21 precepts, each a gem of wisdom. Distilled, they underscore the virtues of independence, acceptance and simplicity. One such precept urges, do not seek pleasure for its own sake. In a world of fleeting joys, Musashi's words beckon us to rise above hedonism, to seek contentment not in externalities, but in the richness of our inner lives. Another admonishes, do not, under any circumstances, depend on a partial feeling. Here, Musashi emphasizes the importance of commitment, of seeing things through with unwavering focus and determination. These precepts, though written centuries ago, resonate with timeless relevance, reminding us of the path to genuine mastery and superiority. Musashi's life was the embodiment of discipline. For him, discipline wasn't a mere routine, it was a way of life. This discipline extended far beyond the battleground. Whether he was honing his skills with the blade, crafting a piece of art, or penning his philosophical musings, Musashi showcased an almost otherworldly level of focus and dedication. He believed in Kaizen, the principle of continuous improvement. It's not about reaching a destination, but about embracing the journey itself, constantly refining one's skills, character, and understanding. But what can we, in our modern era, learn from a samurai who walked the earth over four centuries ago? Perhaps it's the realization that true mastery, be it of a craft, an art, or life itself, demands more than just talent. It demands sacrifice, patience, and an insatiable hunger to learn. In today's world, where distractions are myriad and patience sparse, Musashi's teachings become even more critical. In an age of instant gratification, the path of discipline, focus, and relentless self-improvement seems almost revolutionary. One of the most profound takeaways from Musashi's legacy is his holistic approach to life. He wasn't just a warrior, he was a thinker, a creator, and a seeker. This integration of different facets of existence exemplifies the essence of a superior man. It's not about being the best in one's chosen field, but about harmonizing various aspects of life to reach a state of balance, fulfillment, and unparalleled excellence. The figure of Musashi standing alone, wielding two swords, encapsulates this balance, combining raw power with refined strategy, brute strength with mental acuity. For modern men navigating the complex terrains of today's world, this imagery serves as a potent reminder. A reminder that the journey to becoming a superior man necessitates the harmonizing of heart and mind, power and peace, combat and compassion. Musashi's parting words in the Dokodo are, never stray from the way. It's an exhortation, a clarion call to remain steadfast in our pursuit of excellence to not be swayed by ephemeral distractions and to continuously tread the path that aligns with our true purpose. The way might differ for each individual, but the principles remain consistent. Discipline, focus, and an undying passion for mastery. As we glean insights from Musashi's life and teachings, we're reminded that the way of the superior man is neither easy nor straightforward. It's strewn with challenges, temptations, and trials. Yet it's this very journey with its highs and lows, that chisels an ordinary man into a figure of superiority. A man who, like Musashi, becomes an embodiment of strategy, skill, and sublime wisdom. In the intricate dance of life where energies intertwine, there emerges a voice that resonates with many modern men, guiding them through the nuances of masculinity, purpose and relational dynamics. This voice is none other than David Deida, 
a thinker whose insights on the masculine essence have sparked revelations for countless individuals navigating the complexities of modern relationships and self-identity. His magnum opus, The Way of the Superior Man, is not just a guidebook, but a reflection, a mirror held to society, urging men to tap into their deep, authentic masculine essence. But what is this essence? It's not the culturally conditioned aggression or dominance, but a core energy, a potent blend of direction, purpose and integrity. It's the unwavering strength and presence that a man brings to every situation, not as a force of oppression, but as a beacon of stability and consciousness. Central to his philosophy is the idea that every individual, regardless of their gender, carries within them a blend of masculine and feminine energies. While both are essential and valuable, David's work particularly shines a light on the modern man's struggle to understand and channel his inherent masculine energy in a world that often misconstrues or misrepresents it. This energy finds its highest expression in the pursuit of a deeper purpose, a purpose that extends beyond mere personal gains or societal accolades. It's an inner calling, an unwavering commitment to a cause, an ideal, or a passion. Yet, intertwined with this quest for purpose are the intricate dynamics between men and women. He delves deep into the challenges and beauty of these dynamics, emphasizing the magnetic pull of polarity. He argues that the more strongly a man can root himself in his masculine essence, the more naturally he can attract and harmonize with the feminine energy. This isn't just about romantic relationships, it's a broader dance of energies that plays out in various facets of life. In The Way of the Superior Man, he discusses the pitfalls men often encounter, from losing themselves in their partnerships to sacrificing their deepest purpose for the illusion of safety. The superior man, in David's vision, does not shy away from challenge or discomfort. Instead, he leans into it, using the friction as a catalyst for growth, deepening his presence and sharpening his direction. It's a journey that demands vulnerability, authenticity, and a willingness to traverse the depths of one's psyche. Beyond just relational dynamics and personal purpose, his work touches the realm of the spiritual. He beckons men to not only explore the realms of ambition and relation, but to dive deep into the ocean of consciousness. This spiritual dimension is where the superior man finds his grounding, where he connects with the infinite, and where he derives the strength to navigate the ever-shifting sands of life. It's here that a man learns to be both a rock and water, firm in his convictions, yet fluid in his adaptability. In a world that often offers conflicting narratives on masculinity, he presents a vision that is both refreshing and deeply resonant. It's a vision that invites men to rise above superficiality, to pierce through societal constructs, and to discover and embody their authentic masculine core. Through this journey, what emerges is not just a man who understands his purpose and navigates relationships with clarity, but a superior man, one rooted in consciousness, integrity, and an unwavering commitment to growth. As we reflect on David Deida's insights, we are reminded that the path to becoming a superior man is not one of isolation, but of connection. Connection to oneself, to one's purpose, to others, and to the vast, intricate tapestry of life. It's a journey that demands courage, introspection, and a relentless pursuit of truth. And in this journey, as he so eloquently puts it, lies the way of the superior man. Amid the towering pillars of Rome and the vast stretches of its empire, a figure clad not just in the garb of an emperor, but also in the cloak of philosophy reigned. Marcus Aurelius, Rome's philosopher king, stands as a unique beacon in the annals of history, a leader whose might lay not just in the expanse of his empire, but in the depths of his thoughts. At the crossroads of power and introspection, his life and writings offer timeless insights into the essence of Stoic leadership and the path of virtue. 
Marcus Aurelius's writings, primarily his personal journal known as the Meditations, are not grand treatises or verbose expositions. Instead, they are intimate reflections, whispers from the heart of one of the most powerful men in history, grappling with the same questions, fears and challenges that humans have faced across ages. It's a testament to his quest for virtue, for understanding, and for a life led with purpose and integrity. A primary tenet that flows through Marcus Aurelius's musings is the call to virtue. To him, virtue wasn't a mere buzzword or a convenient facade. It was the very bedrock of life. He wrote, Just that you do the right thing, the rest doesn't matter, cold or warm, tired or well-rested, despised or honored, dying or busy with other assignments. Because dying too is one of our assignments in life. There as well, to do what needs doing. Look inward. Don't let the true nature of anything elude you. Such a simplification coming from an emperor overseeing a vast and complex administrative machinery is profound. It strips away the complexities of situations, reducing them to their essence, a moral choice where virtue stands as the guiding light. But Marcus Aurelius's stoicism wasn't just about personal virtue, it was intricately tied to his role as a leader. Leadership, especially in the turbulent waters of Roman politics and wars, was a Herculean task, with myriad challenges both external and internal. Here the Stoic principles he embraced became his anchor. The Stoic philosophy, with its emphasis on discerning between what's in our control and what's not, was his compass in the stormy seas of leadership. He believed that while external events, opinions or outcomes might be beyond one's grasp, one's own thoughts, actions and responses were squarely within one's domain. This stoic principle is encapsulated in his words. You have power over your mind, not outside events. Realize this and you will find strength. This realization is transformative. It shifts the focus from fretting over externalities to cultivating an internal fortress. It's about realizing that while the world might be in chaos, one's mind can remain an oasis of calm and clarity. This shift doesn't advocate passivity or resignation. Instead, it urges proactive engagement with the world, armed with the wisdom of discernment and the shield of equanimity. For Marcus Aurelius, another key aspect of Stoicism was its universality. The principles he espoused weren't limited to the corridors of power in Rome. They were, and remain, universally applicable. Whether one is an emperor or a farmer, a general or a poet, the challenges might differ, the stakes might vary, but the core Stoic tenets remain the same. His leadership was a dance between action and reflection, between wielding power and yielding to wisdom. In one of his reflections he mentions, the best revenge is to be unlike him who performed the injury. Such insights underscore a leadership style rooted not in retribution or power plays but in dignity, respect and virtue. The world has seen countless rulers, leaders and influencers but few have left behind a legacy as enduring and enlightening as Marcus Aurelius. In a world rife with power dynamics and ambitions, his life stands as a testament to the fact that true leadership is not just about external conquests, but internal mastery. As we delve deeper into the essence of Marcus Aurelius and Stoicism, we uncover not just historical insights, but contemporary lessons. In our modern world, with its complexities and challenges, the Stoic principles embraced by Marcus Aurelius beckon us with renewed relevance. They remind us that amidst the ever-changing external landscape, there lies an internal realm waiting to be mastered, a realm where virtue is the ruler and wisdom is the compass. In the gilded corridors of ancient Rome, amidst the opulence and grandeur, a figure of paradox emerged, weaving a narrative that would echo through millennia. Lucius Seneca, statesman, playwright, and one of the most prominent Stoic philosophers, 
stood at the intersection of wealth and wisdom, power and introspection. His life and teachings serve as a profound exploration of the delicate balance between material abundance and philosophical enlightenment. Seneca's story is one of contrasts. Born into a prominent Roman family, he ascended to become one of the wealthiest citizens of Rome and a trusted advisor to Emperor Nero. Yet this very man, surrounded by the trappings of luxury and political influence, was also one of the most vocal proponents of Stoic philosophy, a philosophy that often advocated simplicity, endurance and equanimity. This duality of being deeply embedded in the material world while remaining a torchbearer of Stoicism lends a unique richness and authenticity to Seneca's teachings. A central theme that pervades Seneca's writings is the relationship between wealth and virtue. To him, wealth in itself was neither good nor bad. It was instead a tool, a resource, a means to an end, but never the end itself. He once famously stated, It is not the man who has too little, but the man who craves more, that is poor. Such insights, coming from a man of immense wealth, carry a weight of lived experience. They are not mere philosophical musings, but reflections born out of navigating the complexities of affluence. One of his most enduring lessons revolves around the idea of enjoying life's blessings without becoming subservient to them. He was no ascetic. He didn't preach the renunciation of wealth or pleasures. Instead, he advocated a mindful engagement with them a conscious consumption that appreciates the luxuries without being ensnared by them. In his words, slavery resides under marble and gold. It was a cautionary reminder that the chains of dependency could very well be forged in gold. This stoic detachment was not a call to indifference but a path to true freedom. By being in control of one's desires and not being overly attached to material possessions, one could truly enjoy them without the constant fear of loss or the insatiable thirst for more. Such a stance required immense introspection and self-awareness, qualities that Seneca believed were the cornerstones of a life well lived. Seneca's perspective on wealth also extended to the realm of generosity and societal responsibility. He believed that wealth brought with it a duty to uplift, to support and to contribute. To hoard or to indulge mindlessly was, in his view, a betrayal of this responsibility. True wealth, he professed, lay not just in accumulation, but in the judicious use and distribution of one's resources. However, beyond the tangible dimensions of wealth, Seneca's teachings delve deep into the riches of the mind and soul. To him, the greatest wealth was wisdom, the ability to discern, to understand, and to navigate life's vicissitudes with grace and equanimity. This pursuit of wisdom was not a passive endeavor, it was an active, relentless quest that often required one to question societal norms, challenge personal beliefs, and at times, swim against the tide. In a world that often measures success in material terms, he stands as a timeless reminder that true success, true wealth, transcends the tangible. It's rooted in the depths of one's character, the expanse of one's understanding, and the quality of one's actions. In examining Seneca's life and teachings, we are invited to reflect upon our own relationship with wealth and wisdom. In the modern age, where the allure of materialism is pervasive and often overwhelming, Seneca's stoic principles beckon us with a clarion call. They urge us to strike a balance, to embrace the bounties of life without being ensnared by them, and to constantly strive for a wealth that is both profound and enduring. A wealth that melds the gold of material abundance with the diamonds of wisdom. The vast landscapes of philosophical thought are punctuated by towering figures but few stand as challengingly and provocatively as Friedrich Nietzsche. With piercing insights and a rhetoric that both baffled and enthralled, Nietzsche carved a path that beckoned the brave and the audacious. At the heart of his philosophy lay a clarion call to humanity to rise, to transcend, and to embrace the potential of the Ubermensch. His world was one of transformation and upheaval. 
The old orders were crumbling, the comforting certainties of religion and tradition were being questioned, and humanity found itself on the precipice of existential uncertainty. Into this maelstrom, Nietzsche's voice emerged, not as a soothing balm, but as a fierce challenge. He saw a world ensnared by what he termed as slave morality, a set of values that stemmed from weakness and celebrated mediocrity. Against this backdrop, he envisioned the rise of new values, values that were not handed down by deities or societies but forged in the crucible of individual will and passion. God is dead, God remains dead, and we have killed him, he declared, encapsulating the profound shift in societal paradigms. But this wasn't a statement of despair, it was an invitation, an invitation to humanity to step up and create new values, values that reflected the complexities and potentials of human existence. The onus was now on man to become the creator, the sculptor of his own destiny and values. Central to this transformative vision was the concept of the Ubermensch, often translated as the Overman or Superman. But who or what was this Ubermensch? Not a being of physical prowess or superficial superiority, but an individual who had transcended traditional values, societal norms, and the weight of existential nihilism. This Ubermensch was a beacon of self-overcoming, a symbol of what humanity could aspire to in its highest form. For him, life's inherent struggles and challenges weren't barriers, they were catalysts. Each challenge, each tribulation was an opportunity for self-overcoming, for growth, for metamorphosis. Just as the alchemical process transforms lead into gold, he believed that confronting and embracing life's challenges had the power to elevate an individual molding them into a superior version of themselves. But this journey towards becoming the Ubermensch was not a smooth ascent. It was a path fraught with perils and uncertainties. It required the individual to embrace the will to power, to confront their deepest fears, to shatter their self-imposed limitations, and to continually strive for a higher state of being. It was about recognizing that life was not about seeking comfort or avoiding pain, but about growth, evolution, and transcendence. The struggles then were not mere hurdles, but vital components of the journey. He proclaimed, what does not kill me makes me stronger. In this declaration lies the essence of his philosophy. It's a celebration of resilience, of courage, and of an unyielding drive to rise above the mundane. In a world that often seeks safety, his philosophy is a resounding gong urging us to not just face challenges, but to relish them. For in each challenge lies the seed of transformation, an opportunity to inch closer to the Ubermensch's ideal. It's a call to break free from the chains of conventional morality and societal expectations, to chart one's own course and to embrace the glorious uncertainty of existence. As we delve into Nietzsche's profound insights, we are reminded of the immense potential that lies within each of us. The potential to redefine ourselves, to shape our destinies, and to rise above the ordinary. The path of the Ubermensch is not reserved for the select few. It beckons to each one of us, urging us to challenge, to question, and to transcend. In the dance of existence, where challenges and triumphs ebb and flow, Nietzsche's philosophy stands as a timeless testament to humanity's indomitable spirit. It's an invitation to look beyond the horizon, to dream audaciously, and to stride forth with the heart of a lion, ever eager, ever hungry, ever seeking the heights of the Ubermensch. In the harrowing shadows of barbed wires and under the watchful eyes of Nazi guards, amidst the indescribable horrors of concentration camps, a beacon of hope and resilience emerged. Dr. Viktor Frankl, psychiatrist, neurologist, and Holocaust survivor, stands as a testament to the indomitable human spirit, a spirit that seeks meaning even when engulfed in the abyss of suffering. Frankl's seminal work, Man's Search for Meaning, is not just a memoir, it is a philosophical exploration, a psychological treatise, and above all, a guide to finding light in the darkest of times. 
Through its pages, readers traverse the chilling landscapes of Auschwitz and Dachau. But more than the external atrocities, they are led into the inner chambers of the inmates' minds, where battles of a different kind raged. At the heart of his philosophy is the belief in logotherapy, a form of existential analysis that posits that the primary human drive is not pleasure, as Freud suggested, but the pursuit of what we find meaningful. Even in the harshest conditions, surrounded by death and devoid of freedom, Frankl observed that those who could find meaning, even in the smallest of moments or in the most mundane of tasks, exhibited a resilience that often defied logical explanation. He wrote, Everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. In the brutal environment of the concentration camps, where every aspect of one's existence was regulated and restricted, this insight was revolutionary. It underscored the idea that while external circumstances might be beyond one's control, one's internal response, the narrative one crafts, remains a bastion of freedom. One of the most poignant moments in man's search for meaning is Frankl's reflection on how, amidst the squalor and degradation, he would often think of his wife and their love, a love that transcended the confines of the camp and offered him a sanctuary of solace and purpose. This realization that love could serve as a source of meaning even when stripped of everything else became a cornerstone of Frankl's therapeutic approach. But Frankl's insights go beyond the individual. He extends his philosophy to a broader societal canvas. In a world recovering from war and grappling with existential questions, his assertion was clear. Life is not primarily a quest for pleasure as Freud believed, or a quest for power as Alfred Adler taught, but a quest for meaning. The challenges faced by Frankl and his fellow inmates were extreme, almost inconceivable. Yet his experiences and reflections resonate universally. Every individual at some point confronts challenges, faces adversities and grapples with suffering. While the scale and nature of these struggles might differ, the core existential crisis, the search for meaning amidst chaos, remains a shared human experience. As we engage with these profound insights, we are compelled to reflect upon our own lives, our own challenges, and our own quests for meaning. In a world that often feels fragmented, where despair looms large and uncertainties abound, Frankl's philosophy offers a beacon a reminder that meaning can be forged, that purpose can be found, and that even in the direst of circumstances, the human spirit can not only endure but also thrive. The legacy of Viktor Frankl stands as a testament to the resilience of the human psyche. It's a clarion call to delve deep, to seek purpose, and to anchor oneself in the quest for meaning. For as Frankl so eloquently puts it, in some ways suffering ceases to be suffering at the moment it finds a meaning. In the intricate tapestry of the human psyche, where dreams intermingle with reality and where archetypes dance with conscious thoughts, the profound insights of Carl Gustav Jung find their canvas. A pioneer of depth psychology, Jung delved into realms often left uncharted, shedding light on the darkest corners and the most luminous vistas of the human mind. Central to his explorations was a concept both intriguing and challenging, the shadow. The shadow, in Jungian psychology, isn't merely the absence of light or a mere reflection. It represents the hidden, the suppressed, the parts of ourselves that we often deny or ignore. These could be our fears, our desires, our regrets, elements that for various reasons don't align with our conscious self-image or societal expectations. They lurk beneath in the unconscious, often influencing our behaviors, reactions and choices in ways we scarcely realize. But why, one might ask, should one confront this shadow? Why not let sleeping demons lie? To this he offers a profound insight, 
By recognizing, confronting and integrating the shadow, one embarks on a journey towards self-realization, towards individuation. This process of individuation is not about achieving perfection or an idealized state, but about embracing and integrating the myriad facets of oneself, achieving a harmonious wholeness. He believed that confronting the shadow was neither easy nor straightforward. It required introspection, courage, and often a descent into the depths of one's psyche, a personal night-sea journey. Yet this confrontation was crucial. As he stated, one does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. By acknowledging and integrating the shadow, one not only gains insights into one's hidden motivations, but also taps into a reservoir of latent creativity, strength and vitality. This integration, however, isn't about indulging in one's darker tendencies. Instead, it's about understanding them, giving them a voice, and then finding a balance. In this balancing act, the shadow doesn't overpower or subsume the conscious self. Rather, it melds with it, creating a richer, more nuanced self-awareness. Integral to this journey of shadow integration is the realization that the path to becoming a superior man isn't about sidelining or suppressing aspects of oneself, but about achieving a harmonious integration. The superior man in Jung's vision is not a paragon of societal virtue, but an individual who has achieved a synthesis of his conscious and unconscious realms. He's a man who, in understanding his shadows, casts a brighter, more authentic light. His philosophy, though rooted in intricate psychological constructs, offers profound practical insights for the modern individual. In an era where societal masks often overshadow authentic selves, where digital personas can be curated to echo societal ideals, the call to acknowledge and integrate the shadow becomes even more pertinent. It's an invitation to authenticity, to depth, and to a richer understanding of oneself. As we reflect upon Jung's teachings, we're reminded of the complexities and the profound potentials that reside within each of us. The shadows, though challenging, are not adversaries. They're gateways, gateways to deeper understanding, greater authenticity, and a more holistic sense of self. In embracing and integrating these shadows, one doesn't just navigate the challenges of life with greater awareness, but also strides forth on the path of the superior man a path not of perfection, but of profound integrated wholeness. In the turbulent aftermath of World War II, as the world tried to piece together its fragmented psyche, a voice emerged from the ruins, articulating the profound dissonance and disillusionment of an era. Albert Camus, an Algerian-born French philosopher, novelist, and playwright, took center stage in existentialist thought, a movement that grappled with the inherent complexities and ambiguities of human existence. And yet, Camus, with his distinct perspective and fierce independence, often resisted the label of existentialist, forging his unique philosophical path centered around the idea of the absurd. At its core, Camus' philosophy is an exploration of the absurd, the profound clash between humanity's innate search for meaning and the silent, indifferent universe that seemingly offers none. It's a confrontation with the vast, unknowable cosmos, where our cries for purpose are met with silence, our search for clarity faced with enigma. There is only one really serious philosophical problem, Camus wrote, and that is suicide. This stark assertion wasn't a nod to nihilism, but a profound inquiry. In a world that seems devoid of inherent meaning, is life still worth living? Camus' essay, The Myth of Sisyphus, serves as a symbolic exploration of this very conundrum. In the ancient Greek tale, Sisyphus is condemned by the gods to push a boulder up a hill for all eternity, only to watch it roll back down each time he nears the summit. To many, this might seem the ultimate depiction of futility. Yet Camus saw in Sisyphus a hero, a rebel. In that moment, when Sisyphus descends the hill to begin his task anew, Camus envisioned a man who, despite the seeming pointlessness of his task, embraces it with passion, defiance, and consciousness. 
It's in this repetitive act, in the conscious confrontation with the absurd, that Sisyphus finds his freedom and paradoxically, his happiness. Yet, Camus's exploration of the absurd didn't end with Sisyphus. In his novel, The Stranger, he crafts the story of Mirso, a man who, after an act of senseless violence, confronts the irrationality of life and the indifference of the universe. Mursault's alienation, his confrontation with the absurdities of societal conventions and the meaninglessness of existence becomes a mirror for the reader, forcing a profound introspection. For Camus, recognizing the absurd was not an endpoint but a beginning. It was a call to revolt, a revolt against despair, against complacency, against the very notion that life's lack of inherent meaning renders it futile. Instead, in this void, Camus saw potential. Embracing the absurd becomes an act of affirmation, a conscious choice to continue living with passion, authenticity, and a fierce adherence to one's own truths. Central to this philosophy was Camus' unwavering belief in the intrinsic value of life. Even in a universe devoid of preordained purpose, life with its joys, sorrows, and complexities held immeasurable worth. This conviction extended to Camus' deep sense of solidarity with humanity. In the face of an indifferent cosmos, humans were each other's keepers, bound by shared experiences, shared struggles, and the shared journey of navigating the absurd. The lessons embedded in Camus' philosophy are both challenging and liberating. They compel us to confront our deepest anxieties, to question societal constructs, and to grapple with the profound uncertainties of existence. Yet in this very confrontation, in this embrace of the absurd, lies the path to personal freedom and an authentic life. It's a journey not towards finding external meaning, but towards crafting our own, not towards seeking universal truths, but towards forging personal ones. As we delve deeper into the realm of Camus and the absurd, we are reminded of the resilience, defiance and passion that define the human spirit. In a universe that may offer no answers, Camus beckons us to craft our own, to rebel against despair, and to find, in the very heart of the absurd, a life teeming with purpose, passion, and profound connection. As we've journeyed through the realms of philosophy, threading the paths laid by luminaries like Musashi, Aurelius, Seneca, Nietzsche, Frankl, Jung, and Camus, we've been privy to a wealth of insights that beckon the spirit to ascend to the realm of the superior man. Yet philosophical enlightenment without pragmatic implementation remains but a flickering beacon in the vast expanse of life. So how does one embody these profound teachings in everyday existence? Let's pave a practical pathway inspired by the wisdom of these great thinkers. 1. Embrace continuous learning, inspired by Musashi. Dedicate yourself to mastery in your chosen field. Much like a samurai hones his skills, read, practice, engage in discussions, and never let the flame of curiosity dim. Whether it's your profession, a hobby, or a newfound interest, immerse yourself with the zeal of a lifelong learner. 2. Channel your inner energy. Recognize the dynamism within you. Cultivate self-awareness, understanding your masculine and feminine energies, and harnessing them aptly. It's about being assertive when needed, receptive at times, and always authentic. 3. Develop Stoic Resilience from Aurelius and Seneca Life will present challenges. Instead of lamenting them, embrace them as teachers. Understand what's within your control, act on it, and accept what's beyond your grasp. Celebrate life's blessings, but don't be enslaved by the desire for more. 4. Confront your shadow, guided by Jung. Engage in introspection, 
recognize the aspects of yourself that you've suppressed or denied. Accept them, integrate them, and in doing so, attain a harmonious wholeness. 5. Carve your own path. In a world teeming with voices dictating norms and values, have the courage to listen to your own. While appreciating collective wisdom, don't be shackled by conformity. Trust your intuition and tread your unique path. 6. Seek meaning, even in adversity, from Frankl. Life can be unpredictable, even cruel. Yet even in the bleakest moments, search for meaning. It could be in the love of a dear one, the satisfaction of a job well done, or the simple pleasure of a sunrise. 7. Embrace the absurd, with Camus. Life won't always make sense, and that's okay. Instead of seeking external validations or universal truths, craft your own meaning, rebel against despair, and in the heart of the absurd, find your passion and purpose. Now, intertwining these insights, let's chart a practical roadmap. Daily meditation and reflection. Start your day with a moment of stillness. Reflect on your actions, aspirations, and the lessons these philosophers offer. Let it be a grounding ritual. Journaling. Document your journey. Write about your challenges, your moments of enlightenment, and your personal growth. It's a mirror to your soul and a testament to your evolution. Active learning. Dedicate a part of your week to learning. It could be reading, attending workshops, or simply engaging in meaningful conversations. Service. Remember Frankl's search for meaning and Camus' emphasis on solidarity? Incorporate service into your life. Help, volunteer, make a difference. It aligns you with a purpose larger than yourself. Engage in arts. Whether it's painting, music, or any form of art, let it be your portal to confronting and integrating your shadow, as guided by Jung. Physical activity, be it martial arts as inspired by Musashi, or simply a daily exercise routine, let it be a testament to discipline, focus, and the continuous journey of self-improvement. Open dialogues, discuss, debate, and share. Talk about your feelings, your insights, and your journey. It's therapeutic and offers fresh perspectives. Challenge yourself. Regularly step out of your comfort zone. Take on a new project, travel to an unfamiliar place, or learn a new skill. It embodies the essence of Nietzsche's call to embrace challenges. Practice gratitude. Every day, reflect on at least three things you're grateful for. It's a nod to Seneca's teachings of appreciating life's blessings without being enslaved by them. In essence, the journey to becoming the superior man isn't about reaching a destination. It's a continuous process of self-discovery, growth, and evolution. It's about embodying the teachings of these great philosophers, not just in profound contemplations, but in everyday actions. For in the weave of daily routines, in the choices we make, and in the challenges we embrace, lies the path to true superiority. As we conclude this exploration, let it not be an end, but a commencement, a starting point for each viewer to embark on their unique journey, a journey of self-discovery, where the contours of one's essence are mapped and understood, a journey of self-improvement, where the gaps between one's potential and reality are bridged, and a journey of mastery, where skills, virtues, and insights are honed to their pinnacle. In this odyssey, the destination is not a fixed point, but an ever-evolving horizon. It's a call to rise, to strive, and to embrace the multifaceted journey of becoming a superior man. Let the wisdom of the ages be your guide, the experiences of life be your teacher, and the fire of passion be your fuel.